Hello and welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome everyone online and everyone here in person at the Knopfel Center. My name is Immaculata DeVivo and I'm the other co-director for science programming with Ido Berger who did just an outstanding job this morning uh, leading um, the sessions and very high bar, Ido. Um, well, this morning's session was, um, you know, Ido and I with Becky, we planned it, but you just never know how it's gonna, and it's just been remarkable. And if I had to encapsulate in one line what we learned this morning is that, or at least what I learned is that climate change impacts us all. However, what we find with no surprise that it impacts the disproportionately the vulnerable population. And I'm sure this is a theme that will run throughout the afternoon session as well. Uh, also inspiring was the poster session. Um, the, our, the future bodes well, is all I can say. And without taking time away from our very esteemed uh, colleague and uh, the, the provost for climate and sustainability, um, Jim Stock is here, who will give a few uh, remarks before I introduce the health session, uh, which is the first session that kick off the afternoon. James Stock is the vice provost for climate and sustainability. He is the Harold Hitchings Bourbon uh, Professor of Political Economy in the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences and a member of the faculty of Harvard Kennedy School. Please invite me, please uh, give a hand to uh, Jim and he will come and give us some remarks. Thanks so much, and it's a real pleasure to be here. It's, uh, it's just great that um, the Harvard Radcliffe Institute is running this uh, conference or this symposium on uh, climate and uh, its impacts, and, and especially uh, the climate justice and uh, aspects of this. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be, have had the opportunity to work with the Harvard Radcliffe Institute and uh, to, uh, to drive this forward. Um, and this, this sort of activity of having a symposium like this is exactly the sorts of things that we want to have more of and we want to drive forward and it's just great to see, to see this happening. I wanted to say a couple of words. Um, a little, I, I hope that you, I hope you excuse me as a vice provost, I'm not probably supposed to talk about substance, but, um, but I'm going to do that anyway, so apologies in advance for trying to add intellectual content to a vice provost talk. Um, you know, this is really a fascinating time. So uh, I'm an economist. Uh, I work on um, U.S. Uh, energy policy, U.S. climate policy. So I'm going to talk about that because that's something I know of. And I'm going to talk about some opening questions. And this is a really fascinating moment in U.S. climate policy and U.S. energy policy. <clears throat> We actually have, because of technological advances, of which we're all aware, between the price, to, we have a vast array of technologies now where the prices have come down so much for photovoltaics, for wind, even for offshore wind, the prices are quite remarkably dropping. Uh, for lithium ion batteries and electric vehicles, we really can see, uh, we really are at a tipping point where a lot of the technologies that 10 years ago were just pipe dreams and incredibly expensive, now are actually feasible and viable. Uh, we tend, it's, it's useful to think about what policy might have looked like 15 or 20 years ago. 15 or 20 years ago, frankly, it was like, you know, aside from hydro and nuclear, there really weren't any options for clean electricity at scale. Um, and uh, electric vehicles were like completely not a thing. So, uh, so it was really uh, difficult to see how you could do deep decarbonization uh, other than through punitive measures like carbon taxes. So the you know, first rounds of policies 20 years ago really focused on things to make carbon more expensive, emissions more expensive. Now that we've done this enormous transition, in, in, in part because of other policies that were to drive forward technology, now that these technologies have matured, we have this opportunity to really uh, just uh, just just move forward with these technologies that are much less expensive. You know, the the Inflation Reduction Act is an absolutely huge step forward. It is it's tremendous. There's hundreds of billions of dollars, or 370 billion dollars, that are being driven towards uh, clean energy across and, and different aspects of the energy uh, energy transition in the Inflation Reduction Act, and um, it's uh, it's it's great to see that. I think it's worth keeping in mind that the Core, the centerpieces, the core parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, which are the wind and solar tax credits, or investment and production tax credits, 
uh, and then the uh, electric vehicle subsidies, um, are, are those actually, those core, core elements are really quite old. So those were used to drive forward these technologies. Uh, the energy, in the uh, inflation, excuse me, the um, investment tax credit and production tax credit, I believe, date back to the Energy Policy Act of 2005. I think the uh, uh, the EV tax credits date back to about 2011. Of course, they weren't really used too much. They weren't in. They weren't really used too much just early on because these technologies were so uh, expensive. Now we're really able to use them to drive forward investment. And I think even though there's a lot of things I could talk about that would that are sort of imperfections of where we are and about the work that needs to be done in the power sector. One of the most salient ones, and I think one of the ones that relates to this conference in particular, is the work that needs to be done now is take advantage of these cheap costs, take advantage of these tax credits, build out a clean electricity grid so we can really decarbonize the grid, build out electric vehicles so we can really decarbonize the light duty vehicle fleet, and but do that in a way that is, well, fast, because we need to do this now, do it in a way that is equitable, do, that is, do it in a way that is inclusive. So we need to, and do it in a way where we don't just have uh, impacts, negative impacts on the same communities that have just suffered a, a lot under the fossil fuel regime. So uh, how, does, how does one think about that in concrete ways? Maybe I can give you two examples. So one of the most important things we could do in the power grid in the power system is to increase the amount of transmission capacity so that we have an, an, a really huge wind potential in the central belt of the United States. We have really strong solar potential. I mean, not so much in Massachusetts, but you know, once you go a little bit farther south, we have really good solar potential. How do we get the electrons from clean, uh, clean uh, wind and clean solar into uh, the rest of the country? And so that is uh, the, the way you have to do that is to build transmission. That is really difficult. We need to have major reform of how we do transmission siting, but that reform needs to have it needs to have a fast process and a decisive process, but an inclusive process where it respects the different communities and not just runs roughshod over the same communities that have been run roughshod over in the fossil fuel industry. So, so that's a really important set of questions. These are human system questions. It's not really. It's not really a technology cost question right now. Um, it's a human systems problem, and we need to figure out these human system problems. Let me give you another example. Electric vehicles are really taking off. You can actually get an electric vehicle on a life cycle basis. Well, if you can get an electric vehicle on a life cycle basis, it's actually less expensive or about the same as a counterpart internal combustion engine vehicle, and that's definitely going to be the case two years from now. And there's going to be lots and lots of varieties of electric vehicles to choose from. Well, the sticker price is more for an electric vehicle, so that's one problem. Uh, so if you're cash constrained, like a lot of our poor communities are, then it's going to be difficult for you to buy that electric vehicle, even if it's something that would save you money over the long haul. How are we going to address that problem? And moreover, how are we really going to, the, I, I argue, sort of based on our own research, that one of the biggest problems with electric vehicle rollout is actually the problem of charging stations. Now, I have an electric vehicle, I've got a house, I have the property rights to be able to install a charger in my garage, so I have one. Uh, not everybody has those property rights. If you live in an apartment building, how are you gonna get the opportunity to charge your vehicles? We can't end up in a situation where I live in a nice house and I have an electric vehicle and people who live in more urban environments and apartment buildings and have lower, lower incomes and lower means have to continue having gasoline and diesel vehicles all over the place and worsening their health impacts and not being able to take advantage of the cost savings that electric vehicles are going to be providing. How do we make that happen? Again, this is a human systems problem. It's a difficult question. Let me pivot a little bit to the vice provost business. Difficult questions are what academics are good at posing and academics are good at tackling. Um, they're not necessarily good at like tackling them in a super real world way. One of the things that we want to do with the Salada Institute, the new Institute for Climate and Sustainability that we just announced um, in, uh, in June, is to pull faculty together from across the university to work on the hard problems, the important problems of climate change, so we really drive forward climate, 
climate, climate solutions to, uh, over the course of this decade and the next decade. We need to have an equitable, equitable, equitable carbon-free economy. We want that transition to occur as soon as possible, no later than by 2050. How can we make that happen? There are lots and lots of hard questions. I, as an economist, I tend to think of the human system side. I listed a few of the human system problems today. We're going to hear about some of the health problems in just a minute or so. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that these are incredibly important problems that we collectively, as faculty, students, uh, and members of the Harvard community more generally, need to work on. And I'm really excited to do that. Let me also just um, point out or do a little bit of advertising. Our main initial kickoff event for the Slada Institute is uh, next week. It's on the 26th. It is in this room. Uh, if you haven't uh, registered online, or if you haven't registered, please do so. And uh, I look hope to uh, see you here. Thank you, Jim, and uh, so thank you for reminding us about the Salada Institute. Uh, yes, Ido and I will be here next week, and uh, we are very proud to be part of that institute as well as it being launched here at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. So without taking any more time from the health session, I'd like to um, introduce Ari Bernstein. Ari Bernstein is a colleague of mine at the Chan School of Public Health. He is now serving as the interim director of the Center for Climate Health and on um, global environment at the Chan School, and he's also uh, assistant professor of pediatrics at the Harvard um, Medical School. So uh, as our, the health session will be moderated by uh, Ari, as he asked me to call him and not Aaron. Um, so Ari, please come up, and may I ask the speakers to also take their seats on the, on the stage, Teresa Amaruda. And I want to, um, Nick Watts uh, will be here with us remotely uh, from England. And Nick will speak to us on climate health as it's happening at the NHS. So, Ari? Thank you, Mark. Well, Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I have the great opportunity to moderate our session on health this afternoon. Um, for those who would like to ask questions, I encourage you to do so. Uh, my understanding is you all know how to use Slido, so um, I'll be monitoring those questions as we go. Um, uh, this session is going to focus on a specific intersection of the climate change concern that uh, matters to all of us, which is health and health equity. Um, we have three folks um, who I'm going to very briefly introduce um, who will cover some of the angles on the issues, um, but please uh, delve into their much more extensive and deserving than I will give them uh, biographies uh, through uh, the agenda you have. Um, so to my left is uh, Teresa Crimmins, who's a professor at the University of Arizona. She's an expert in phenology. She also directs uh, the National Center on Phenology. The National Phenology Network. Network. USA, I should specify. USA yeah. National Phenology Network, because there are phenology networks in other countries, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And to her left is Amruta Nori Sarma. She is an assistant professor uh, at the School of Public Health at Boston University. And joining us virtually uh, is Nick Watts. Uh, Nick, um, who I've known for a while, is now uh, the, uh, in charge of the National uh, Health Service's mandate to decarbonize um, the entire uh, British United Kingdom health system. Um, so uh, each speaker uh, will have an opportunity to give some remarks. Uh, we'll then uh, do some question and answer among the panel, and then we will turn to your questions. And to kick us off, without further ado, Professor Crimmins. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ari. It's fall, everybody. I hope you've had a chance to be outside, even just a little, and appreciate the beautiful leaf color change that's happening right outside the door here. I, I appreciate it especially because I live in Arizona, as Ari indicated, and we don't really get this phenomenon unless we go up into the mountains. So this is pretty cool. And all across the Northern Hemisphere, we're experiencing signs, very clear signs of autumn now. The, the leaves changing color, the migration of geese and other birds to the south, pumpkin spice everything, <laughs> and 
Is this how I advance? The yes, it is. Okay. Um, we know what's coming next. Cold, dark days of winter. And after we've suffered through enough of those icy, icy mornings where we have to chisel our windshield free of, of the frost, we can't wait for the signs of spring. We anxiously anticipate that first crocus peeking through the snow or the first migratory birds reappearing in the spring and starting to build nests and buds opening, flowers such as daffodils that grace our yards, or maybe some of those more diminutive flowers that we don't maybe notice as readily, like this red maple that's up in the upper, upper left. One of the things that we heard about this morning is that climate has changed dramatically and significantly in the last several decades and centuries. And one of the major ways that we see that change taking form is in increased temperatures globally and also in, in, in more concentrated in particular parts of the, of the world. And those warmer temperatures are taking the form of warmth early, occurring earlier in what we call the spring season and then lasting later into the fall. And as a consequence, a lot of plants and animals are responding too by advancing their activity in the spring and then delaying it into the fall. Those longer growing seasons um, that are being driven by increasing temperatures, as well as that increase in CO2, the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, those things are basically acting like fertilizers to plants. To put it simply, plants are, are growing longer for a longer period of time than they used to in the past. They're growing larger because of this fertilizing effect. And what that's leading to is more pollen in the air. And just a recent study indicated that since the 1990s, which is just 30 years ago, I mean, I remember the 90s, it was not that long ago, we now have a pollen season here in the US that's 20 days longer than it, used, than it was back then, and we have an uh, increase of about 20% more pollen in the air. All of that additional pollen in the air is leading to significant health effects. Globally, we estimate that there are about 400 million people that suffer from seasonal allergies, and the number is increasing, and another 300 million suffer from asthma. And these, these, these can lead to consequences like just feeling crummy, maybe missing some days of work, um, or impacts to your everyday life, all the way to hospital, hospitalizations. In order to really be able to manage these allergy effects, it's, it helps to be able to understand what our sensitivities are. And I was talking with Jocelyn about this over lunch. If any of you have ever actually tried to do some allergy testing, you've probably suffered through one of those prick tests where they poke you and try to figure out, are you sensitive to birch? Are you sensitive to pines? Are you sensitive to oaks? Are you sensitive to maples? And if you have a lot of sensitivity, it's a really miserable test. The reason why, why your doctor wants to know that is because your, your therapies can then be tailored toward that and help, hopefully help to mitigate your, um, your conditions better. The trouble is, we might know what your sensitivity is, but we also need to know what the heck is in the air or when those different kinds of plants are gonna be releasing their pollen so that you actually could tailor your treatment to that. Presently, we don't have very good information on what pollen is in the air across the country at any given time here in the United States. We've got a network of about 80 stations shown in the map here um, that are part of what is called the National Allergy Bureau, and these are private st stations, privately run and managed and funded stations led by allergy doctors and hospitals, whereby they have a sampler typically up on the roof or mounted on a pole, and they have to go collect a sample from that passive sampler on a regular basis and then look at that sample underneath the microscope like the person in the upper right here is doing to identify what is the kind of pollen that's in the air and how much of it is there. As you can imagine, this takes some time and some money. And some of these stations that are run are generously sharing their information, like you see in the, the pollen forecast on the lower left, which is derived from the data from one of these National Aller Allergy Bureau stations. But many don't, um, and so there's huge gaps in what we actually know about what kind of pollen is in the air at any given time. And I know you're thinking, but I see those pollen forecasts in the news and on the Weather Channel. I've heard anecdotally those are actually driven more by aller the sales of allergy medication than they are based on actual data. So what can we do? How can we know actually what's going on in the air at any given time across the country? 
Well, I propose an alternative. I should have put a question mark here <laughs> rather than an exclamation point. I guess I was feeling excited about this. Um, but there's, there, there are some alternative sources of data that may be able to help piece together this puzzle. And as Ari indicated, I'm the director for a program called the National Phenology Network here in the United States. And one of the major activities that we do is run a program called Nature's Notebook that engages both professional and citizen scientists all across the country in keeping track of what they see happening in plants and animals at any given time over the course of the growing season. So the fact that I see leaf color change in sweet gum right here, right now, is a data point that I could log and could be of use for future research. We do this, our program was established in 2007, and we've been running this, the Nature's Notebook program since 2009, primarily motivated originally to better understand how plants and animals are responding to changing climate conditions, because so many of them are shifting the timing of leaf out and flowering and migration. However, those data that are being contributed are being used in all sorts of different applications as well. Um, more immediate things like invasive species management, agricultural practices, um, anticipating wildfire risk, all sorts of things. And there's applications in the human health realm as, as well. Um, since we launched the program in 2009, we've had over 25,000 folks go on to submit data, and we've amassed over 30 million records so far. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, the potential that exists there and what's been realized so far. Participants in Nature's Notebook make regular repeated observations on individual plants. And every time they go make an observation, they're reporting on the status of what they're seeing. And so the salient bit here is open flowers, is flowers. And the sequence of photos here for some of our plants that are problematic for, for pollen that can create uh, uh, lead to allergies, we're, what we're seeing is not open flowers on the left and then eventually leading to open flowers on the right. And you can even see some pollen on the, the observer's fingers in the lower right there. And you might notice, though, these flowers are not very flowery. <laughs> and that is because these are wind-pollinated plants. And it's the wind-pollinated plants, not the animal-pollinated plant plants, that, cause, that, that generate the pollen that are problematic for irritating uh, the lining of our lungs. And so, people aren't maybe as likely to observe on these particular flowers or even to recognize them as flowers unless we tell them to. But what's cool is we actually have had a lot of data contributed uh, for these different species anyway. And we, what we've been trying to do is evaluate whether, I can't get this to go now. Uh-oh. Do I need to point it on anything in particular? Or can somebody just advance? Oops, nope. OK, there we go. OK, so I, what I have been doing is working with a team of folks from the Center for D Disease Control and Prevention, um, a couple of different academic institutions, and then some private allergists to try and evaluate whether those observations of whether flowers are open or not that have been reported to, through Nature's Notebook um, actually can help fill that gap and how well those observations align with what's been reported or what's being recorded at those National Allergy Bureau station sampling sampling stations. And th so this plot is just one example of those two of those data sets that have been collected for oak species in particular near the Armonk, New York station in 2018. And the black line and the dots show you how much pollen was reported on a given day over that growing season um, by the National Allergy Bureau station. And then the blue line indicates the proportion of observations that were submitted to Nature's Notebook where the person said, yes, I do see open flowers. And though we don't see a, a um, real perfect fit between the magnitude of the peaks, we do see temporal patterns that align, suggesting that these observations that folks contributed, letting us know whether they saw open flowers in oaks or not back in 2018 around Armonk, actually did an okay job of characterizing the pollen season there and suggests that maybe there is some potential here. And then when we expanded this comparison to all of the NAB stations for which we were able to access data for all of the different plant taxa that were, we had data for, we had some mixed results. And what we show here is every dot here is one of those plant taxa at one of those stations in a single year. And the colored circles are ones where the relationships were significant, meaning that the two patterns seemed to move together in co coherently. And if it's gray, the relationship was not significant. And so there's promising results here, and there's a lot of um, potential, we'll say, <laughs> remaining potential.
But what's exciting is that those data, again, were not collected with this application in mind. Um, and anybody can participate in this program. And so what we're starting to talk about now is since there's some potential being hinted at here, could we maybe launch a campaign where we really encouraged folks, particularly individuals that suffer from allergies, in playing a role in managing their symptoms better in this indirect way by getting outside and making observations and then contributing to a national database that, that can be, then be used in this way. And what's cool, again, is that we have a lot of real active participation all across the country already that we can capitalize on and try to in, uh, engender this activity uh, through. And I want to just make a real quick shout out to a very active group here, very local. Uh, there's been a group um, involved in tracking the phenology of over 75 plants at the Arnold Arboretum here on campus called the Tree Spotters. And since they launched in 2016, they've, they've logged over 300,000 observations of plant phenology. And I'm certain that they're not aware. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that nobody who's contributed their data to Nature's Notebook is aware that their data are being used in, in this way. Um, they tend to participate for other reasons. And so there, it's, it's pretty exciting to think that we could let them know and then see if we can engender some more participation along those lines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Crimmins. Professor Norisama, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today, and um, I'm really grateful to be here with my fellow panelists. Um, I'm Amrita Nori Sarma, and I'm an assistant professor at Boston University in the School of Public Health, um, and I'm a member of the new Boston University Center for Climate and Health Research. And I'm really excited to be talking to you today about some of the work that I've been doing looking at the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, and the thing that really drives me, I was really uh, moved by the sessions this morning, and so I was thinking, what is the thing that really drives me, and what is the thing that I'm passionate about? And I guess the way that I could characterize it would be, what does the data show us, and what are new applications of existing data that we can use um, in all types of contexts, in places where data may be plentiful, in places where data is very sparse, and so that's really where I've uh, made my academic home is how can I make data more accessible to different audiences and how can I use data to show the things that are happening as a result of climate and environmental exposures? Um, and the other thing that I wanted to just chat about briefly before I dive into my talk is why health? Um, I've been working in public health for many years now. I have a master's in public health, and of course now I'm a faculty member in a school of public health. And I think it's really a relevant thing to think about for this context of climate change. Um, and one of the things that occurs to me is that some of the strategies that people advocate for, the mitigation and the adaptation strategies, it takes a long time to see those signals in terms of the climate benefit and the ecosystem benefit and the environmental benefit. But if we, if we advocate for good health and if we implement strategies for mitigation and adaptation that have health protection, we can see some of those benefits almost immediately. And so I think that really motivates um, for me why the focus on the, the health impacts of climate change. So I don't think I need to convince anyone here that climate change is a problem. Um, seven of the warmest years on record in the contiguous 48 states of the U.S. have occurred since 2014. Um, 2020 is now ranked as the second warmest year in our available 141 years of temperature data. I'm sure if 2022 was added to this list, it would be near the top. I'm sure everybody has experienced heat waves around the world starting, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere in December in Australia and continuing on throughout our intense summer season, even here in Massachusetts. Um, and we know that climate change is going to lead to more extreme events, including heat waves, but also storms, wildfires, droughts, the whole host of things that we've been talking about today. And as climate leads to more days with extreme summertime temperatures, we know that the burden of disease associated with extreme heat will change as well. 
And the impact of extreme heat on physical health outcomes has been very well documented. So I was super excited when I was invited to talk here today. I said, oh, you know, I'm going to create a summary of all of the literature around climate change and extreme heat and physical health impacts. And then I did a, a Google Scholar search, and there were 600,000 search results. No way I'm going to be able to summarize that. But I just pulled out a few um, that I thought were really illustrative. So this shows uh, extreme heat and mortality in Spain using a multiple city analysis method. Um, and so what they found is that across many different cities around Spain, there were increases in mortality associated with increasing temperatures. Um, some of our own work in our group has looked at emergency department visits across the United States and different um, hospitalizations and, and types of emergency outcomes, including across all causes for emergency visits as well as heat-related illness. We found increases in renal disease um, and cardiovascular disease as well. And we've also looked at um, the impacts of different types of heat alerts. And so not just looking at temperature as an exposure, but looking at is there a benefit of implementing different types of heat action plans. And we, so this study looked at um, the impacts of heat on elderly adults using Medicare data across the US and found increased uh, rates of uh, different types of outcomes among older individuals and also found that there was limited evidence that there's changes depending on whether or not a heat wave day is declared by the National Weather Forecasting Service in the US. But the impacts of elevated temperature on mental health are relatively less well understood. And that was interesting to me, um, and I think there are a few reasons why. One of, the, one of the things is that mental health is very difficult to quantify. Um, how do you look at what a mental health outcome is? It may be different depending on whether you're older or whether you're younger, depending on your context, where you live. Um, so I think that one of the things that we've really struggled with, going back to what I was mentioning at the beginning of my talk, is what are the data? What are the things that we can look at? What are, what are the, the things that we can quantify to say, oh, we actually, we anecdotally understand that climate change is causing people to be more anxious and more stressed, but how do we actually know what the impacts are? So what we did for this particular study that I'm talking about today is that we wanted to quantify the relationship between temperature, ambient heat, and mental health-related emergency department visits. Um, and we did this in the 48 contiguous US states among adults. Um, and we looked at overall mental health as well as specific causes. And I'm also going to share a little bit of the information that we looked at to try and identify who's the most vulnerable um, by age, by gender, and by region within the US. So to do this work, we rely on county-specific daily maximum temperature data on a continuous scale from modeled temperature data. Um, we defined extreme heat as the 95th percentile of county-specific temperatures. So um, I know that's a little bit of a strange way of saying it, but if you think of a summertime that lasts for 100 days, it's about the five or six hottest days each summer. So comparing those five or six hottest days to the coolest days in the summer, how many people are additionally going to the emergency department during those five or six hottest days? And it's really interesting to do this work across the entire US. And the reason for that is because the US is very different depending on where you live. So this shows what is, what is the temperature for those five or six hottest days depending on where you live across the US. And what we see is that in the northeastern US, temperatures are relatively lower compared with the southeast and southwest US. That's pretty, pretty intuitive. We might guess that that's the case. Um, so now going back to the data question, what are the outcomes that we were interested in? So we were able to find and highlight uh, a little over three and a half million emergency department visits for mental health among a little over two million individuals across the entire US. Um, we did this using uh, data from the Optum Labs data warehouse, which is people who have commercial health insurance. I would like to put a pin in that because that's a very important point. These are people with health insurance, a particular commercial provider of health insurance who visit emergency departments in 2,700 counties across the US. So this is a relatively good data set. Um, it represents longitudinal health information, people who are patients in emergency departments, um, some people who are repeat visitors to emergency departments, and it's a fairly diverse mixture of people. 
And this is what that looks like. So the places in dark blue on this map are places that have larger numbers of emergency department visits for mental health. And the places in light blue are places that have relatively fewer. So this could be two different things. Again, you know, what is the data really telling us? This isn't necessarily saying that everybody in New England is super depressed and always going to the emergency room. Um, it might be that more people in New England have this type of commercial health insurance and that's why we see more emergency department visits. And what we found, which was super fascinating, is that as temperature increases, the rate of visits to the emergency department for mental health increases as well. And this was true when you look across all causes of mental health that we included in our data set. It happens immediately. That's what the figure on the left shows. It happens either the same day or the following day after the high temperature occurs. And this is also true if you look at different causes of mental health, um, uh, of mental health emergencies. It's true for substance use disorders. It's true for anxiety and stress. It's true for mood disorders. It's true for schizophrenia. It's true for self-harm. It's true for childhood onset emotional and personality behavioral disorders. And it's true in almost the same way for each of these causes, despite the fact that the things that are happening in each of these different mental health outcomes is relatively very different. So this is really important. Um, once again, for each of these different specific mental health outcomes, it happens either the same day or it happens the following day. And overall, we found that on those five hottest days of the summer, compared with the coolest days of the summer, there's an 8% increase in rates of emergency department visits for any mental health cause compared with the coolest days of the summer. And this may not seem like a lot, it's 8%, but amplify that over the entire population of different parts of the US. And you can see that as temperatures increase, there may be increasing emergencies related to uh, mental health, and we need to be able to cope with that in our emergency care system. We also interestingly found that places in the northern parts of the US were more prone to higher rates of emergency department visits compared with the southern US, which was really fascinating because as we saw, the temperature map would show that the southern parts of the US are hotter. Maybe that points to different levels of adaptation that are already existing in populations across the US. Maybe in the south, there's more penetration of air conditioning usage, for example. So we found that days of extreme heat were associated with higher rates of mental health ED visits. We think that these results may be informative for clinicians and help them to prepare for those times when emergency department visits for mental health increase. But there are some limitations to this work, and I want to focus in on this for a minute. Um, we focus on emergency department visits. So once again, we're relying on what the data can tell us. But what emergency department data can't tell us is about all of the people who are having mental health crises that will never see a doctor and will never go to the emergency room. So there is an untold number of people who are experiencing subclinical or maybe even clinical outcomes that we don't capture in this work. It also is people with commercial health insurance. So there's a whole population of people on publicly available insurance or people who uh, are not insured who are also not captured in this population. So I think that this is an underestimate of the actual burden of mental health that's associated with increasing temperature. So I just want to acknowledge that there are many people who were a part of this research, and I'm particularly grateful for the fantastic students that we have um, who have led on some of the initiatives following up on this research as well. Um, and thank you very much again, and I'm really excited for the discussion today. Thank you, Professor Nori Sarma. Uh, and I believe Nick Watts, there's Nick. Nice to see you, welcome. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you, Ari, good to see you. I'm sorry I'm not there, hey? Um, nothing I would like better than to not be in this country at this particular moment. Um, for the weather and a few other reasons. Um, listen, I was gonna talk about three things. Uh, I was gonna talk about why the NHS might care about climate change. I was gonna talk about what we were gonna do about it. But frankly, having heard the discussion that's just been set up and thinking about it, if you're in this room, you probably know deep, deep down in your heart why a healthcare system would care, should care, must care about climate change. So I don't really need to cover that. 
What I should probably say is give you just a little bit of context about what the NHS is and what its contribution is, both positive and negative, to climate change. I want to focus on the how, though. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to focus on the why or the what. I want to focus on the how. I want to focus on the tangible question. Once we've agreed this is important, once we've set a target, what are you going to do about it? This 9 a.m. tomorrow morning question that we fixate on. So that context I promised for the NHS, well, we are big. How big? 1.4 million healthcare professionals. About 155 billion pounds of spend. Fifth largest, I think, fifth largest organization in the world. The NHS is responsible, responsible for about 5%, 5.4% of the UK's national emissions, roughly the same size as the entire country of Croatia or Denmark. About 40% of public sector emissions, 36% of public sector power consumption. So we're big, right? The why is simple. You take the science that we've just heard about seriously, and everyone here knows you should. Well, you understand the climate crisis is a health crisis. And if you understand that the NHS exists to deliver high quality care for all now and for future generations, we understand that you simply can't do that unless you run at this problem. So we can move on from the why, boring, easy. The what. Once you acknowledge that, and you acknowledge that it is genuinely a crisis, and you acknowledge that healthcare has a lot to be responsible for, we've sat on our hands for the last two or three decades, broadly, broadly at a global level. So we've got a long way to catch up. The NHS set a target for itself, 2040, net zero by 2040 for the emissions we control directly, and 2045 for our full total footprint. Let me add the little caveats that everyone must add whenever they say the words net zero. Number one, that includes an offset target of no more than 6% for our direct emissions, 8% for our indirect emissions. And anyone that tells you they're offsetting more than 10% is lying to you. Tell them to go away and stop using those words. Number two, we have annual reduction milestones and we have an 80% reduction target by 2028. We have a last mile problem in healthcare. We don't have a problem tackling this stuff early. In fact, because we've sat on our hands for so long, running at the low-hanging fruit is relatively doable. So whenever anyone says net zero, you have to ask about offsets. Yes, you have to ask about interim milestones, of course. You also have to, and you mustn't tolerate anyone that says, I can't answer this question. You must demand that they also tell you about their scopes. And so I've been clear. For the, net, for the NHS's total footprint, our 2045 target, that is scopes one, two, and three. Anyone that says that they can do scopes one and two, but scope three is a little bit tricky or it's hard to calculate or any of that nonsense, the time for that was back in the 1990s and you stand up and you say, you're lying, move on. All that stuff is easy. All of that stuff is boring. Though the far more interesting question is the how, is that 9 a.m. tomorrow morning question. So the stuff I'm going to talk about for the NHS is. Uh, is either stuff that we have done in the last six months or stuff we're going to do in the next six months. Anything outside of that, I think, is missing the urgency of the problem. So in the last six months, the NHS has invested £657 million into decarbonizing our estate. It looks like about a third of our hospitals now currently building solar panels on the brown land, on the roof space they have. It looks like a new net zero hospital standard applied to everything the NHS builds over 15 million pounds. We're sick of building old, outdated forms of healthcare facilities, hospitals, primary care facilities that our patients don't like, that our staff don't like, that are bad for the planet. You take that estates question, your acute que estates question seriously. We also have to then think really seriously about how we move patients around that estate about the transport system. So the NHS is responsible for about 15,000 vehicles in this country, second largest fleet in the country, second only to the Royal Mail, I think. There's broadly two categories there that we're worried about. Firstly, there's the electric vehicles, either in cars or in vans. And we heard uh, at the very, very start why we shouldn't necessarily be worried about that. Quite frankly, it is cheaper for the NHS to purchase an electric vehicle today. And so we have trusts all over the country. Manchester Foundation Trust, we think, is about to be the first group of hospitals, eight hospitals anywhere in the world, to be running fully electric, fully electric for its cars, for its vans, for its rapid response vehicles, and for the trucks, 24-ton trucks that are electric, delivering things across the city up in Manchester for it. 
that stuff, frankly, I'm not that worried about. The stuff we are worried about is the niche stuff, is the stuff that uh, no one other than a healthcare system is going to tackle. Elon Musk won't help us build a double crewed ele electric ambulance. So for that, we've had to innovate. We've got two prototypes at the moment that we're playing around with, one fully electric, carrying patients across all 10 of our ambulance trusts across the country. And then an electric hydrogen hybrid, the hydrogen range extender about an, adds another 210 miles or so onto that ambulance. It gives us the ability to hit rural populations across the country. And I appreciate rural in uh, the United Kingdom is a very, very different concept to rural in the United States. That's exciting because two years ago, there was no such thing as a zero emission ambulance. Now there are zero emission ambulances across each of the major ambulance trusts in the country. What is even more exciting is when up in the Northwest, they said, God, we really like these. Do you reckon we could have a couple more? And they put in an order for 22. Immediately seeing that and not wanting to be outdone, London said, yeah, well, we like them a lot as well. And we're going to put in order for another 60 and we want them by the end of the financial year. And when you turn around and say, why, why are you guys moving so fast? Surely you have other places to spend your money. They respond with, Nick, you don't understand. This is urgent. And by the way, it actually saves us quite a bit of cash in the long run. So we've had to tackle our hospitals and the energy efficiency requirements and the energy production requirements there. We've had to tackle our transport and those 15,000 vehicles across the country. We also have to think seriously about our medicines, about the stuff that we buy. For the NHS and indeed in healthcare, in low carbon healthcare, if you have had more than one and a half seconds of a conversation about this, someone has said the words desflurane to you, someone has said anesthetic gases, and someone has said inhalers, someone has said, said metered dose inhalers. There are two good reasons for that. In both cases, there are clinically equivalent alternatives that we can easily swap to that are cheaper that are far, far lower carbon. And so in both cases, the NHS is sick of talking about what we might one day do on Desflurane. Last year, we just started phasing it out. First, we proved we could do it with one hospital. We're now up to 48 hospitals, 48 trusts across the country. A modern healthcare system simply does not need that anesthetic gas. The Royal College of Anesthetists now no longer asking politely, demanding that the NHS remove this. The same true for metered dose inhalers. Quite frankly, their carbon footprint of some of the worst of them, Vendelin in particular, is astronomical, is unacceptable. And so the NHS is expressing a strong preference there. Yes, there are situations in that case where an MDI is clinically, uh, clinical, clinically appropriate, clinically necessary, in fact, and they're absolutely perfect. Continue as you were. But outside of that, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, along with the NHS, is now recommending that unless there is one of those good clinical indications, we don't start patients on MDIs anymore. We start them on their dry powder inhaler, their lower carbon equivalent. Taking those two actions as a whole, that deals with a full 5% of the total carbon footprint of the NHS. So we have to deal with our hospitals, we have to deal with our vehicles, we have to deal with our medicines, we have to deal with the stuff that we buy, our procurement. We've been clear, within the decade, the NHS will no longer purchase from anyone, any company full stop that does not meet or exceed our ambitions on net zero. That's a vague term. So to clarify, one minute past midnight, April 1st, 2027, the NHS is introducing new qualifying criteria just to enter into a financial negotiation with the NHS. We want to know that you are moving at the same pace as us. We want that to be public and we want it to be approved annually by your board. We mean that for all 82,000 of our suppliers. And the first three that said, Nick, you can't be serious. We're not going to comply with that. Very quickly had their contracts terminated and found out how serious we were. We've had to deal with all of that. And we've had to deal with some boring things. Governance. We have one national net zero strategy in the NHS, but that isn't really enough because this stuff has to come to life. It has to really mean something to the patients, to the communities, to the clinicians across the country that are going to drive this. And so we made sure as the Health and Care Act of 2022 in this country was updated right into the beating heart of the NHS, we made sure that there were new duties out. If you want to be a hospital licensed by the NHS, you need to have your own net zero strategy aligned with all ours. You need to have board level leadership taking this on and nothing other than that is going to be acceptable. 
in only six months, every single hospital in the country turned around and produced that strategy. Every single integrated care system produced that strategy and every single region in the, in the country produced it and appointed those board level leads. So we've had to do all of the practical, tangible stuff, the procurement stuff. Governance has been very, very important for us. Finally, we've had to innovate. This stuff is complex and you can see me talking with a bit of bravado, but you have to underpin medicine is complex. And so decarbonizing medicine is going to be deeply, deeply complex because I'm not just talking, we're not just talking about turning off a light, turning the temperature down and then going home. We're talking about every single drug currently used in clinical practice being reformulated. We are talking about every single clinical pathway, taking a serious look at some of these net zero strategies and saying, what does this actually mean for the way I deliver care and changing that every single part of medicine. And so the innovation has been important. We've invested 31 million pounds into innovation at all levels, small businesses partnering with clinicians across the country, academic centers popping up across the country, tack tackling low carbon healthcare. And then finally, uh, into our clinicians. It's our uh, strongest asset, most important asset. We had a micro grant scheme that we've just closed the other day. If you were a community nurse, if you were an occupational therapist, if you were a pharmacist and you had a cool idea, you had wondered, God, does it really have to be that way? Couldn't we do this better? We had 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds for you. And the criteria were damn simple. You had to directly improve the health of your patients. You had to tackle climate change and you had to have fun. We were worried uh, when we announced this that, you know, our workforce is tired. Maybe we wouldn't get enough applications. Maybe we'd get 50, 60. Uh, and that would be okay because COVID had been a rough time for the NHS. What we forgot was that this agenda energizes like nothing else. We forgot that every time we poll NHS staff, nine out of 10 of them say, I want to work for an NHS that is delivering against climate change. I want to take my own role in that. And I want to start to action that today. Far from 60 or 70 applications, we had 17,000 applications from nurses, from doctors across the country. We had to close the thing early because it was far, far too popular. That's where I'm going to leave it. I wanted to talk about the tangibleness of what this means at 9 a.m. tomorrow. I've given you a, fully, a few examples, but maybe to end where um, the first speaker left off back at the very, very start, whether or not the NHS, whether or not a healthcare system is able to tackle climate change, whether or not we're able to run at this quite as fast as we need to is not a technological question. The technology to do this frankly exists today. It is not an economic question. The average ROI for the average intervention the NHS wants to make in this pays back in 3.7 years. It's not a financial question. It is fundamentally about whether or not we can empower, enthuse, motivate 1.4 million healthcare professionals and many, many more across the world to take this on, to redefine, frankly, the face of medicine. What we've seen from that micro grant system so far is pretty good news. Nothing energizes our staff like taking hold of the future of their own profession and driving towards a healthier planet. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, and delighted to have you with us virtually. All right, so it's about three o'clock, and we have a whole series of questions coming in from all of you, uh, and I would like to uh, try and use those now uh, and skip the ones that are percolating through my head, having been in your seats many, many times. I have routinely felt that the folks who are paying closest attention get the shortest shrift. So um, let me start with a question uh, for you, Professor Crimmins, which um, has to do with extending what you showed us around pollen to other ways in which phenology affects people because, of course, and one of the things that I think is, in my experience on the interface of climate and health is, you know, as, as E.O. Wilson, um, uh, who has a tree planted not far from here in his memory, uh, once told me, you know, we, we humans like to think we float in what he called a techno-scientific plane above the web of life. And I think some of your evidence starts, it really grounds us in the reality that we are in fact tied to the living world and that all of us are subject to the climate of the plant. So what are the, some of the other ways that you see your work relating to the welfare of people? 
Thank you. That's that's a great question. Uh, yeah, <laughs> indeed, we are not immune from seasonality, really, um, because that's what that's what phonology is: is when stuff is happening over the course of the year. Um, and really, I'm often I'm often challenged to define phonology. I I dislike that that word is in the title of our organization. I didn't name it. Um, I would not have chosen to use it, but it's a good un ent entryway for helping people understand. That's an off-putting term, but it is something that you absolutely are so familiar with. And the reason why is that it infuses every aspect of our lives, including health. And so, yeah, um, some of the other ways in which phonology intersects with our with our lives and and with climate change and how changing climate is being impacting, impacting phonology and then in human health as well, um, is in the potential spread of disease. Uh, another thing that we're experiencing, again, with warming temperatures, is we're seeing longer, longer growing seasons means that we can have more generations of insects within the period where they can be reproductive, meaning that there are the potential for more particular insects to be present that are, that are shifting diseases around. And also, if we don't have as cold of winters, we may not, we are tending to not see um, as much dieback during the winter for some of those vectors. And specifically, um, it's mosquitoes and ticks that are some of the worst, but um, there are others too. Uh, and so that's a, that's a major concern um, out there. <laughs> and, and that does tie directly to, to um, seasonality. Uh, and then an another way, another thing that I'll mention too, because it intersects with Amruta's work, is is in mental health. Honestly, I really like to to um, encourage folks to step out and track phenology, make observations of the plants or the animals in their yard, primarily because it's a wonderful thing to do, <laughs> because it feeds our soul. First and foremost, it's just. And I find this, I can speak from such direct experience about this. Um, I'm your standard workaholic kind of person that is like, yeah, 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 nature, it's cool, it's good, it's good. But if I, I actually have a reminder that goes off on my phone every Saturday morning that says, go out and make your nature's notebook observations. And when I do, without fail, I'm so glad I did. I, it's just a moment of pause. I'm looking at these trees. I'm documenting what I'm seeing. And without fail, I see something that I would not have seen otherwise. And so it's good for me. And then the secondary benefit is that I'm also generating, I'm, I'm logging data points that can be used and referenced in perpetuity to know what was happening in my yard at that, on that particular day. So, um, I love this intersection of using citizen science for the purpose of tracking the data you were showing in your presentation, but also for mental wellness. As a pediatrician, um, I'm particularly mindful about how these things are destroying our children. Um, and how the evidence is increasingly clear that very early in life, cultivating mindfulness starts by, ups one of the best ways to do is by cultivating this habit of observing nature. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like this is a great multi-solve potential uh, in, in what you describe. Uh, Professor Nori Sarma, there's a question actually, um, you mentioned uh, this issue of, of winters and changing seasons. Uh, a question from Melissa Goodman directed to you is what about uh, colder winter temperatures getting warmer? Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly, um, she points out that you know, darkness, you know, there's the seasonal effect disorder that, that light cues actually can affect risks for depressive symptoms in particular. She, she sort of suggests that maybe that's an overwhelming signal, but do you have any reason to think that the changing lower temperature effects or maybe how people behave in the context of winter may be affecting mental health? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. And um, so when we looked across the warm season, um, there's a specific reason for that. And the reason is that the methods that we use, some of these um, ep epidemiologic methods, um, we've seen very different impacts of that lag that I mentioned. So where for hotter days we see on the same day or the next day we see increases in emergency room visits, um, it turns out that during colder seasons, the effects are more cumulative over several days, several weeks even. Um, and so I think this is a very complicated question about what happens in the winters. Because on the one hand, we might expect that on average, the temperatures would get warmer during the winters. But on the other hand, climate is an issue of extremes. And so we might expect that the most extreme and severe events will become more extreme and severe in either direction. So we might expect to see more extreme wintertime storms and nor'easters, um, as we like to call them here. 
And so I think that there is potentially a very complicated relationship between warming wintertime climates and our mental, or both our physical and mental health. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is that when we look at emergency department visits across the entire year in the data set that I showed before, we actually don't see increases in rates of emergency department visits during cold season. Um, it's actually very linear. We see uh, lower rates of emergency department visits in the winter and then a steady increase as the, the temperatures get warmer. Um, and I think that that might be an indication of um, a couple of different things that are of interest here. So the first one being that, um, who are the people who are visiting the emergency department and why are they going to, to an emergency room? And uh, who are the people who maybe are experiencing adverse mental health and not going to the emergency department? And so I think what's probably happening in winter is that there's, because of all of these different complicated factors of our environment, maybe people are less likely to seek out medical care. So I think that from that perspective, I think there's a need for more more data and more research to understand what those relationships look like in the winter and how climate may be changing those relationships. Excellent. That's a very easily followed and excellent answer. Um, Nick, a question for you. Um, this question essentially asks that the NHS under your leadership is clearly making great strides to getting to the scientifically informed target uh, around decarbonization. Um, although there have been recently in this administration in the United States um, parallel efforts to push to decarbonize, I think it's safe to say that we are nowhere close uh, to the same trajectory. And are there points that you would suggest that would help catalyze the action you're seeing in the UK uh, here? So let me let me start by saying, I mean, you and I know, both know um, the United States has been doing some pretty impressive stuff just very recently, um, uh, starting to pick this up. A close friend of ours, John, is, is leading the charge there um, in HHS. And that's no small change, right? It is no small change for there to be an Office of Climate Change and Health Equity taking on decarbonization in the United States. It is echoed across the world. In France, they are just hiring out now for 87 people to enter into the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs, Social Justice in France, uh, to take on the ecological crisis, as they call it. In Germany, they're reorientating one of the departments in their federal ministry, a new department of environment and climate change in the federal ministry of health. In Spain, uh, the health minister herself has, has, a, um, has a net zero target and a team taking this on. I was just down in Australia, one of the last places, I'm Australian, one of the last places I would have expected to take this stuff on seriously, Western Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, Tasmania, and the and federally, they have climate change teams within their health departments now. The world is shifting, and this is no longer becoming a fun, nice to have. It's becoming an inevitable direction of travel. But, but to answer your question, I'm sorry. Um, when I look around the NHS, at a macro behavior change sort of level, three things matter, autonomy, capacity, and a bit of fun. Autonomy matters and giving people the sense that this is something that a high quality, that a good clinician engages with, a good clinician, good medicine is low carbon medicine, that matters. And we do that through our job descriptions, through our quality improvement programs, by embedding this into the NHS constitution, into the Health and Care Act. The capability, the time, matters right and so we it's what some of those micro grant schemes are about that's what that innovation funding is about and finally fun um i think the technical word is interconnectedness or something there's some management theory <laughs> um but fun uh if you look around politics if you look around formula one and i i'm a terrible sustainability person so i follow formula one um you look around rugby i also follow a bit of that it is the team that is having the most fun that I will always put my money on winning. It is the guys that are enjoying themselves, that are learning something, that are smiling, high-fiving. Take a look closely at British politics on both sides of the aisle at the moment. You'll get a quick sense of which team is winning. That has been probably the most important thing, that we don't berate people, we don't angrily say, why didn't you do this? When we look around the NHS and we find the great examples, those examples I was giving you of the anaesthetists or the examples we have of 
ambulance trusts who are just purchasing zero emission ambulances and zero emission rapid response vehicles all the inhaler switches we're doing those are being led quite frankly by passionate anesthetists anesthetic technicians they're being led by passionate paramedic by passionate asthma nurses who said i think we could do something different and i'm not going to worry too much about focusing on the perfect on absolutely everything i can do the problem is too big I'm going to worry about the one little thing, the bucket of carbon that I uniquely control, that my tribe uniquely controls, and I'm going to change that. And I'm going to change it at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I think it's the focus on the tangible and on the present that is important. Anything other than that, we end up getting a little bit lost, I think. Well, I don't know if John's listening, Nick, but I expect he would take those words to heart. Thank you for that. <laughs> that response. Um, I want to ask a question um, from, uh, and I'm going to probably um, mispronounce your name, but Dr. Olalaye, um, who raised the issue that much of our conversation has been focused on wealthier nations. And I want us to consider all of what you've discussed in the context of a lower or middle income country. Um, and I might frame that specifically to each of you through your, your specific angles um, on the issue. Um, um, but Professor Crimmins, I think you know these issues uh, that you raise around phenology are obviously not unique to any particular country. Are there differences that you know of that would that would make the issues somehow different in a in an African nation or, or a South Asian nation? Our, our phenology effects change are differential as so much with climate change. The effects are differential based on the region. And, and what does that what does that mean in your line of work? That's a great question. Um, mm, ha, yes, phenology is changing everywhere. It's changing in different ways in, uh, around the globe. My understanding of it is that that's primarily driven by climatic factors and the changes in those drivers more so than socioeconomic conditions. However, how it does play out, your question intersects with the citizen science angle or the volunteer um, ways in which we collect data because <sighs> What's true in so many of these volunteer programs is that the folks that participate are the folks that can, That mean, meaning that they have the free time. They are able to take this on as an um, additional activity. By and large, there are not a whole lot of programs focused on observing nature that are um, treated as, as critical as getting food on the table or getting access to clean water. And so there's greater participation in these programs in more affluent countries. And in truth, in many countries, phenology networks don't exist because that's just not on the country's radar. So we definitely have an imbalance when it comes to data themselves and where they're coming from. And, and by extension, then, what we're able to say about how things are changing is, is skewed in that way, too. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, to, to, so to the extent that climate resilience, you know, you can't protect against what you don't understand, what yeah. I hear you saying is that we actually do need to make investments in low and middle income countries to do the kind of work to know when risks are coming that may be based on phenology, whether it's pollen, insects, uh, certainly agricultural pests, um, because, you know, we need that data to actually protect those most at risk. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and I think... We need to rethink the model too. <laughs> you know, leveraging volunteers is one way, and it has it it is bearing into generating some fantastic data sets, and not just on phenology, and not just even on um, plants and animals. It's it's there's so many different kinds of, of observations that that volunteers are making through through programs known as citizen science. Recognizing that term is not. That, that term, which is the umbrella term for programs where folks that weren't necessarily trained in a scientific endeavor are, are invited to play a role either in data collection or sometimes also in analysis or interpretation or communication. Um, that's the term that we default to, even though it's not great, because there hasn't been one that's been brought up that's better so far. But th there are amazing discoveries that have been made in astronomy and um, in human health, actually, in protein folding and, and all sorts of different applications, too. Uh, the trick is, though, again, if we really want to be able to get the data that we need to address pressing issues, maybe that's not the only approach that we should be taking. Right. So, so a question along a similar vein to you, uh, Professor Nori Sarma. Your work suggests that the effects of temperature 
you know, the signal what we're seeing in the data is that people show up for care, but it suggests that heat is actually affecting the brain and, and maybe bringing out the potential of mental health symptoms regardless of what shows up in emergency department. So in the context of places where there maybe not are emergency department or healthcare access, but the effect is real, what does your work speak to and what other findings do you think would be helpful to understand the risks to mental health in, in those places? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, one of the things that I want to go back to from the session this morning from one of our colleague panelists was this idea that we should stop thinking about people as being inherently resilient. And I really like that because I think that people experience health impacts of climate exposures and we need to start documenting those. And some of my own research in India and in other contexts has demonstrated that even in those places that are experiencing higher baseline exposures, we still see mortality impacts of extreme heat waves. We still see impacts of extreme storms and other climate-related exposures. Um, and the thing that I think is really interesting is that from the health perspective, one of the ways that we have come up with to try and mitigate some of these effects of extreme exposures is through early warning systems and alerts. And I think that um, it's important to highlight what are the characteristics of vulnerable populations that could benefit from those early warning systems. And so to your question about um, you know, what are the things that would be helpful to know? I think it would, you know, it would be helpful to continue this type of work, leveraging whatever existing local data resources are in those relatively more resource constrained environments um, to try and understand the physical and mental health impacts of heat exposures and other climate exposures. And then also to characterize the potential benefits or even the lack of benefits from those early warning systems and some of those other adaptation and mitigation strategies. And then working and co-creating solutions with local communities that are targeted towards intervening with those populations that need it the most. So even if we don't see elevated rates of emergency department visits for mental health in places where it may still be so stigmatized that people don't feel comfortable showing up in a clinical setting, can we go ahead and assume that there are mental health impacts of extreme heat exposure and reach out to people who might need help during extreme heat wave periods? And um, so just kind of, I guess, ending on on maybe a little bit more of a hopeful note, the thing that we see time and again, I think, in the public health side of things is that one of the most effective tools that we have for preventing or mitigating the health impacts of extreme heat and other types of climate exposures is leveraging social our social networks. So friends checking in on friends and making sure that people who are in your family or your loved ones who are vulnerable are taken care of during those extreme events. And so I think, um, you know, a final word that I might say is um, continuing to build out those social um, safeguards that we have and educating people about the harms that may be accruing to their friends and family and neighbors from extreme heat exposure and climate exposures so that they know, oh, there's a heat wave coming, I should go check in on this person who I know who is particularly vulnerable. Thank you, and your remarks make so clear, Amruta, that um, resilience is so context dependent mm -hmm. that, and particularly I'm mindful, and, and you know, there's a lot of history in colonialism in, in global health, for instance, where models that were developed in places like the United States were exported somewhere else in the presumption that if it works here, it works there. And hopefully we've learned from those lessons, and particularly your points just around heat warning systems. Uh, you know, we really do need to understand the social fabrics and how those play out because, to your point, one of the biggest factors that protects from heat is social, isola social isolation or social connectivity. Right. Um, the other point, which which you raised in your remarks, that your 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 remarks just now reminded me, is that you talked about how actions on climate can confer health gains now, right? And often those health benefits accrue in the communities in which they're taken. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to just take a minute to see your perspectives on the potential health benefits in wealthier countries versus low and middle income countries in terms of those health benefits. Yeah, so that's really fascinating, and I think that's one of those things where. Um, the, we have to be, as you said, we have to be very mindful that the solutions that we propose in one place and in one context may not work 
in another place, in another context. So the best example that I have of this is that I was um, on a fellowship in India, and I was helping with the development and implementation of South Asia's first heat wave early warning system in the city of Ahmedabad, which is in northwestern India. And it was an exercise that was a collaboration between the Indian Institute of Public Health locally, um, the Natural Resources Defense Council in the US, and several academic partners from the US as well as from India. And one of the baseline um, heat adaptation plans that was used for that exercise is the one that was developed for New York City, where they say during a heat wave, if you don't have air conditioning in your home, you should visit a place that is air conditioned. So a movie theater, a restaurant, um, you know, some, some place that you have access to. And so when we were discussing this with local partners on the ground in Ahmedabad, one of the things that was told to us is, well, you can't ask people to go to a movie theater during a heat wave because they may or may not be able to pay for the price of admission. And so rather than wholesale exporting that heat adaptation plan from New York City to this context, we were able to find ways that were locally relevant. So for example, we worked with government partners to make green spaces open and accessible later um, during the day so that people who were experiencing an extreme heat wave period could go and stay in a local park. Um, we also made drinking water available in public bus stands so that people who were in their transit during the course of the day would have access to clean and safe drinking water. And it turned out that these health protective measures were very impactful locally as a part of this larger plan to try and reduce the health impacts of extreme heat. Um, so I think there, there are lessons that you can definitely learn um, from, from places that have been thinking about these questions and have started to implement some solutions, I think that this, the approach, the one size fits all approach is definitely not the one that's going to work from a health, uh, from a health standpoint. So um, I think it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Thank you, Ruta. All right, Nick. So what you're doing in the UK with a head of STEAM um, how do you see it relate to what you have learned? And you mentioned some of these examples already in, in lower and middle income countries. And I'd like you to think about it in, in two angles. One is, um, you know, how you understand the potential opportunities. And I think in the climate sphere with the solution space, there's a lot of opportunity for leapfrogging. Um, I, I think there's been a lot written about how if, if you know, the, the, the global shortage of healthcare access um, were created in the image of the U.S. health sector, it would be a single-handed defeat for the entire climate movement. Um, so there's that. But also, um, are there things you see, you've see you seen in coming from lower and middle-income countries that actually can inform how we can do this better and faster? Sure. So, so yes, right? We, um, we steal shamelessly some of the best interventions we have in our net zero hospital standard uh, enhancing ventilation in, en in an energy efficient way. They come from Thailand, they come from Morocco. A lot of the technology we're using and a lot of the learning we're using for how to locally power and where you can properly run solar out of a healthcare facility comes from China. Um, a lot of what we know about health system adaptation, frankly, the UK is, is good at that, but uh, not as good as uh, what we see in the Peruvian healthcare system. So we we spend a lot of our time uh, working with healthcare systems around the world and stealing as much as we can there. I want to flip that on its head as well, though, right? Um, and we have to be a little bit careful about what the NHS knows and what we are good at. I can talk ad nauseum about heat decarbonization, but if you want to talk about cooling, well, that isn't really a problem that we necessarily have in the United Kingdom. <laughs> um, uh, and so I don't have a huge amount to offer uh in return to to thailand um uh, advice on how they might manage uh, heating and cooling in their in their healthcare system nonetheless uh with the who and some of our friends over there at geneva we are setting up we've announced we're setting up and um we've hired about half the staff for it so we're almost there uh, a new unit dedicated exclusively to taking the work that the nhs has been doing and sharing it and shouting about it as loudly as we can out across the entire world because there's a little asterisk attached to uh, some of the things I was saying. They're attached to our 2040, 2045 targets. There are two ways the NHS can do that. We can either internalize everything. We can move absolutely everything we purchase. We can move everything that we learn about how to run a good healthcare system into the United Kingdom and think of ourselves exclusively as an island, but we'll probably fail. And even if we were successful, it would be damn expensive and a bit of a waste of time. 
or we can do it with others. And we've obviously adopted the, the latter approach. The NHS can't get to net zero unless the rest of the world's healthcare systems are moving there as well. And so while we want to make sure we're taking responsibility for more than our lion's share of the emissions reductions and moving as fast as we can, and if that's the fastest, fantastic. We also want to make sure that we are bringing everyone else with us, sharing what we know, being a little bit humble about what we know about things like heating. Um, uh, and so that's what that unit with the WHO, we hope, is going to get there to do. The exciting part is five seconds ago, there was only one healthcare system that had a net zero commitment. It was the NHS. Uh, Glasgow 2021 in December there, um, 16 other healthcare systems around the world, Fiji, Malawi, Spain, turned around and had their own strategies as well. So you're starting to see that there is a bit of a community of practice engaging with and learning from each other here. Excellent. Thank you. So we have about uh, five minutes to go. And um, I'd like to give the panelists uh, a bit of space here uh, to give some some closing remarks. Um, I might encourage you to, to think, and you can feel free to ignore this. I, th I think the moderator has certain prerogatives in these situations, the panelists have certain prerogatives. Um, um, to think about the work you've discussed today and to think maybe a little bit forward in the next you know, year, two years, about what are the key issues that you see emerging, whether it's questions that need to be answered, developments you see that are really promising, it's a, it's a look from how you view these, from where you sit, how you see these issues a bit down the road. And I will, um, I, I feel like I've been asking Professor Cummins to go first every time. So, um, uh, and, and I don't know if Nick or Amruta, you wanna chime in first, but feel free. Go ahead. <laughs> sure, fine. Um, look, some of my stuff is just me repeating myself. Um, sustainability, <laughs> if you focus on 2040, too far away and we're going to spend our whole time sitting on our hands. So the thing we need to focus on for the NHS is that 9 a.m. tomorrow question. That's the only thing, frankly, that we spend our time thinking of. When you get there and you realize, like I said, it's not an economic, it's not a technological challenge, it's a people challenge, it's a mobilization challenge. That's the thing that I think we are the most worried about is making sure that we can keep up that excited movement Within that, and uh, probably probably for this forum uniquely, I don't get to talk to um, academic forums as much as I would like to or as much as I used to. Um, there is a unique challenge that we face, which is I genuinely think we've gone through and looked at all of the evidence available uh, that we could grab, all the published evidence available we could grab on low carbon healthcare, everything out there. And we have applied everything out there. And I'm not being facetious, I think I mean everything to the NHS and we have enacted that into our policies around our hospital standards, around the medicines we purchase, around the way that we run nephrology care, around the way that we run primary care. And I think we are out of evidence. I think the biggest challenge we face is that we have implemented almost everything that we have evidence for and that'll take a while for it to feed through, right? We've only just started with the policies. They've got four or five years to run before they're completed. But five years from now, if there is not a thriving academic community figuring out what it means to be a net zero nephrology service, what it means to be a net zero community occupational therapist, we're going to be in one hell of a lot of trouble. So it's a bit of a plea for help, maybe not at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, but in the next five years. Well, it's a good thing I have your email address, Nick. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Amruta. So it turns out that if you sit in the middle, you always have a tough act to follow, I guess. Um, so yeah, this is a great question. I think that there are a couple of answers. Maybe I'll parse them out into the mental health angle and then a more general set of questions that I've been thinking about. So from the mental health side, one of the things that I've been asked so many times in the last few months is the role that climate anxiety and eco-anxiety play in this story. Um, so there's a special place for eco-anxiety, and I think um, as was demonstrated very aptly uh, by one of the earlier panelists this morning, um, young people really do feel a sense of climate anxiety and eco-anxiety in a way that I think is 
important and impactful for their health and specifically for their mental health. Because people in my generation and then you know in my daughter's generation, these are the, the people who are growing up in a world where climate change is real, it's present, it's happening right now, and it's impacting people in real time. And they will not have a time when they are not aware of this issue. And so, um, you know, when I've talked to different practitioners, um, especially pediatricians who work with um, younger patients, there's, there's this sense of, okay, we knew that climate change was a problem, why haven't we already dealt with it? And so I think it speaks to this sort of idea of what constitutes a trauma that people face and how the repeated exposure to different types of trauma can lead to compounded uh, physical and mental health impacts for different um, different vulnerable people within our populations. And so I think um, it's really necessary for, for mental health to start to understand and better characterize what the impact is of being anxious about climate change and future climate change. Um, and then maybe from a slightly broader perspective, um, one of the things that I've seen and I think was also talked about earlier is that um, people in, in vulnerable communities tend to face compounded exposures as well as the compound, compounded health impacts. And so I personally think that it's, it's hard to believe that there's a linear increase as people experience more and more types of climate events. So what I've become really interested in is, is there an above linear or is there a multiplicative impact of being exposed to different types of things simultaneously. If you have a hurricane and then you have a blackout and then you have a heat wave and then I think in Southern California a few weeks ago there were like five different climate catastrophes that were happening. Like a hurricane caused a wildfire to become more extreme and more widespread and then there was a flood after there was a drought. I don't know. I think that different segments of society are going to be facing those kinds of interrelated hazards on a more regular basis. And so I think we need to understand the implications of that. Thank you. Thanks for the generous option to go last. I feel like I have to say something really good now. <laughs> the answer to all the crises is go back outside and look at the plants. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> no, honestly, um, I feel like from my perspective, what I'm struggling with or thinking about the most and something that con continues to be present in shaping my work and my efforts is there's this dual tension, you know, of um, I'm still fighting against the fact that nobody knows what the word phonology is, but at the same time, we really, we know that we've got to have information and collect it now and document it now to be able to see how things are changing into the future. And it's really only because there were folks who were, had enough forethought decades ago or even centuries ago to document when they saw wood ducks first arrive on their pond or when cherry blossoms started to flower that we're able to say with confidence now how much things have changed. So my interest is really in trying to identify what are the things that we are going to wish we had data on decades hence. Um, can we divine that so that we can get good observations on it now? Um, and and coupled, coupling that with the fact that I'm, we're always struggling just to have funding to keep the program alive makes it makes it a tall order. But um, I guess the fact the the one thing that we have going for us is that it is it is nature and it is fun to be outside. So <laughs> we're just trying to make it as engaging as possible. And hearkening back to your concern about um, digital devices. Rather than fighting it, we're trying to work with it. And right now, we have an app, of course, because what program doesn't have an app? But our app is very boring. It's basically, <laughs> it was recently described to me as, oh, this is just an electronic data sheet. And this is a, a younger person that I just hired. And she's a Pokemon nut. And we are now legitimately working with the School of Information at University of Arizona, of Arizona to figure out how can we generate an app that's more engaging and brings in younger generations and gets them to pay more attention to what's happening in their yards and on plants and animals that generates high quality data that can be used in the future. So those are, those are my challenges, is trying to, trying to engage younger generations and make sure that we have data and information that is a good, solid baseline for documenting, hopefully, things moving in prop, um, positive trends in future decades. I want to thank our panelists for an excellent set of presentations.
and all of you for your questions.